Today we're going to continue on with our study of chicken embryos. In our last lecture, we talked about chick one, the very early beginning of the embryo development inside an egg and how an egg develops and all that. And we got the embryo in our developmental study last time up to a three-layered little tiny disc up on top of a big yolk material. The three layers underneath, there was a layer of endoderm, which we had previously called hypoblast. On top, there was a solid layer of ectoderm, single layer of cells, which we had previously called epiblast. But in the middle, there was this sort of a flattened donut shape hollow middle layer called mesoderm. And it is the last of the three germ layers to actually form. That's where we left off last time in Chick 1. Now, from that point on, we will begin lecture Chick 2. And so, here we see early development of that three-part little tiny disk of living tissue, of cellular tissue, up on top of the yolk. That's where we're picking up the story today. The, uh, if we look at it with a microscope, dissect it out of the egg and put it on a slide and look at it, we could see that there would be changes in the density of the cells. And so there was a guy by the name of M.T. Spratt. Sounds like a nursery rhyme, doesn't it? But that was honest to gosh his name. And he wanted to know what was happening to those cells up on the top layer, the ectoderm epiblast, and in the middle layer, the donut shape with a hole in the middle, mesoderm, and the underneath layer, the endoderm. So this is 100 years ago almost. He didn't have any radioactive tracers or any dyes specifically or uh, anything that he could use to trace the cells, except he had an old coal oil lamp that had carbon black, tiny bits of totally black carbon soot all over the inside of the chimney. And he took some tiny little carbon particles and put them into this array, this arrangement, up on the top layer, the ectoderm layer of the embryo, and then he watched to see what happened to the particles as the cells underneath them moved. And he noticed that the, cell, that the particles on the ectoderm all began to kind of congregate down on one side into a lump like that. All right. He also did something very similar to the middle layer, the mesoderm, and to the underneath layer of, uh, of cells, the hypoblast or the endoderm, and he noticed that nothing happened to the endoderm. It just sat there. The little carbon particles didn't move. But just like up in the upper layer of ectoderm, the middle layer, also he saw that cells would move and come underneath this lump right here. Together, the two of them would form a very dense area right over here, but the endoderm underneath, of, underneath it didn't participate in this aggregation of cells. And that was very interesting. Then the most interesting thing happened. He saw that from that lump of tissue, a streak would form out across the face of the embryo. The lump was down here to begin with. Here was the cavity in the, in the uh, middle layer, the mesoderm. But this lump would form a streak that moved up like this. And it elongated and elongated. And as it did, this, actually the blastocele, the cavity right here, would get smaller and smaller and smaller as this primitive streak would grow in length up through here. That old blastocele, we changed its name to proamnion because it has a new fate coming up here. 
this is an elongated primitive streak made of ectodermal cells on top, mesodermal cells in the middle, but not the endoderm cells underneath. Nope, that didn't happen. It's going to get even busier here in just a second. In figure E, we see what happens later. This is the embryo now. And we notice that outside of the central elongated streak, primitive streak up through here with the proamnion up at the top, they're developed to the side of that three distinct areas of extra embryonic tissue. One immediately to the outside of the primitive streak that was clear, and the Latin term for that is pellucid. So this is called the area pellucida, the clear area right in here, just around the primitive streak. Now the embryo is going to come from this tissue right in here. But to the side of that, there was a mottled MOTT LED, mottled area, full of lumps called blood islands. The blood islands were made up of a specific kind of cell called angioblast cells, and they are the precursors for blood cells, erythrocytes, lymphocytes, leukocytes, all the different kinds of blood cells. So we have blood islands lumped up out here in this second uh, outer layer, extra embryonic layer. And since it is not pellucid or clear, but is opaque, and light doesn't go through it very well, it's called the area opaca. Now the area opaca is made up of basically two parts, the modeled area here, but around the outside of it there is a blood vessel. It goes all the way around called the sinus terminalis. So the two parts of the area opaca are this area vasculosa, the vascular part, and the sinus terminalis, this outer rim right there. Now, just to the outside of that, there were some very primitive, large, yolk-filled cells out in the third area, just to the outside of the blood vessel. And that is called the, the um, area vitellina, vitellus referring to yolk, because this area out to the outside of it, the third area, is area vitellina. The third area out here is full of yolk-filled cells, large yolk-filled cells. This is the embryo now that is ready to explode with developmental potential. So this lump up on the terminal end, the very front end, the streak went wow and grew all the way up to there and then cells piled up right at the front end, the top end of this primitive streak and that was named by a fellow named Henson. It's called Henson's Node. Now here is a, um, a little short didactic phrase I want you to remember. Henson's Node regresses. Huh? Henson's Node regresses. What does that mean? Henson's Node is now going to begin to work its way back down, go in the opposite direction toward the tail end down here. Henson's node will work down through the primitive streak material, which remember is made up only of ectoderm on top and mesoderm in the middle, but not endoderm underneath. And as Henson's node regresses and works its way back down, it is going to organize the tissue and start it developing into many different uh, morphological and cytological fates. Many different kinds of tissue will come from this primitive streak material, as Ensign's node regresses, eventually it will work its way all the way back down to the very bottom end, down there. And since this is the top end, the anterior frontmost part of the embryo, we can see that development in the embryo is going to proceed with the front of the embryo, the top of the embryo, the dorsal most and anterior most part of the embryo, progressing in its development a whole lot faster than the tail end will down here. Okay, let's keep going. We're going to watch this Henson's node regression in these, there we go, cells. 
This is a 16 to 17 hour embryo. Here's the 18 to 19 embryo, but look what's happened. Henson's node will have regressed during that two hours or so down this far. Now, as it regresses, it pushes out the rod of tissue that is going to become that primitive skeletal apparatus called a notochord right there. Henson's node will continue to regress. And as it regresses, it's going to change mesoderm into various components. And it's going to cause a fold to come in the top of the ectoderm up on top of the embryo on the anterior of uh, the dorsal most area. So here is another experiment that was done with some carbon black. They took a 17 hour embryo, which is pretty primitive here. They put a dot of carbon right in the middle of the proamnion. They put another one on Henson's node and another one way back down here at the bottom of the primitive streak, the tail end down there. And then they watched to happen as the Henson's node regressed and grew down that way with time to 17 hours to, not to 20 hours. And by the time you get to the 33 hour chicken critter, this, this little um, Henson's node dot of, um, of carbon black will have regressed all the way down to the tail down there. And in the process, the mesoderm on either side of the notochord will form two tiny little strips or flat ribbons called segmental plate mesoderm. And as that ages, it will begin then to lump up into distinct linear packets of cells called somites. Boy, are they going to be important. Somites. And so as the, as the embryogenic development takes place and goes further and further along, we see pairs of somites line up on either side of this central line, the notochord. On the top up here, a tube will be formed as the two sides of the ectoderm, the upper layer, come together, form a groove, and then a groove will come and meet at the top to form a long tube called the nerve tube, which eventually is going to give rise to, on the front end of this nerve tube, the brain. And all the rest of it will become the spinal cord. So the brain develops from the ectoderm up on the very top layer of this little embryo into a, a, the front end it becomes the brain and the rest of it becomes the nerve tube which will be eventually the spinal cord leading down to the vertebral column. Wow. So Henson's node first forms a primitive streak and then it regresses and as it regresses it organizes we call it an inducer or an organizer because it causes so many new things to start forming. It organizes the tissue into the formation of, well, underneath here will be the beginnings of a heart, a, a brain up here, a spinal cord down here, a notochord underneath from the mesoderm. Also from the mesoderm we'll get packets, pairs of somites which are going to give rise to muscles and skin and bone and a lot of different things. These are all carbon, primitive carbon grain um, experiments that have been done a long, long time ago. Now, we want to, instead of looking at this from the, uh, from the top, we want to make a slice through it and look at, at a cross section of what's going on as the primitive streak regresses. Here is a cross section through the embryo, right in the middle. We see that up on top, there's ectoderm, ectoderm. In the middle is that middle layer called mesoderm. And in the very middle of it will be the primitive streak, all lumped up right there. Now, these two top layers, ectoderm and mesoderm, are going to um, get real busy being induced and forming things. But that endoderm underneath there just goes to sleep. 
It doesn't do anything. It stays quiescent and doesn't form anything. Um, after a few days, or sorry, a few hours of development, we see that this upper layer of ectoderm will fold up like this, form a groove, and fold up like that on the other side. These are called neural folds. That's another one. And right in here will be the neural groove. Eventually, these folds are going to come together and meet, fuse, and form a tube. The tube will become the nerve tube, which on the front end, as I said, will become the brain. And on the back end will become the spinal cord. Underneath it, from the mesoderm, we will see, right in the very center, a notochord will form, right in there. Chordal mesoderm, it's called. And just to the side out here, lumps or strips of tissue called segmental plate mesoderm will form, and they very quickly will condense into pairs of packets of cells called somites, S-O-M-I-T-E-S. -E so this will become a somite. There's a somite. Now that's that's called intermediate mesoderm. Or Notice that the mesoderm to begin with is just a single layer out on the side out here and out to that side. It's called lateral plate mesoderm. But it does the most interesting thing. It delaminates and forms two layers from one. This layer right here, a top part will come up and a bottom part will come up for, to make a top part of the lateral plate mesoderm and a bottom membrane of the lateral plate mesoderm with a cavity in between, there and there. That cavity is going to be the body cavity, or salome. I know it doesn't look like it right now, but with body folding, we will see how that, that becomes actually the cavity on the inside of the body that literally gets divvied up into around the digestive tract and the viscera, called the peritoneal cavity, the other divisions are the cavity around the heart, called the pericardial cavity. And then the heart, the cavity around the lungs, comes from this space right there. And that is called the pleural, pleural cavity, P-L-E-U-R-A-L, pleural cavity. The top layer of lateral plate mesoderm, once delamination, the splitting into two layers occurs, is called somatic mesoderm. The bottom layer, it's a weird name, it's called splanchnik, S-P-L-A-N-C-H-N-I-C, splanchnik mesoderm. And notice that the splanchnik mesoderm comes to lie just down, or really fuses with the top of the underlying endoderm right there. Here's the big word. When the top layer of somatic mesoderm folds up and fuses underneath the overlying ectoderm, they together are going to form a membrane called somatopleur. Yeah, we'll see it in another drawing in just a minute. It's spelled S-O-M-A-T-O-P-L-E-U-R-E, -E, and it is a two-part membrane made of somatic mesoderm underneath and ectoderm on top, and they come together and fuse into a single membrane. That membrane is going to fold around and form the amnion and the chorion, two of the outer membranes around the outside of the embryo later on. Also, from the um, mesoderm central area, a thin strip of mesoderm will form, and that thin strip of mesoderm will be called segmental plate mesoderm, and it's the transitional structure in that it very quickly, instead of being two little ribbons, flat ribbons of tissue, one on either side of the notochord, here's a notochord, ribbon here, ribbon here, they will begin to condense into pairs of packets of cells called somites. So this lateral plate mesoderm out in here is going to form segmental plate mesoderm, which will give rise to somites, pairs of them, one on the left, one on the right. And then go back a little bit, and there's another pair, another pair, another pair. We'll look at those. The older the embryo gets, the more pairs of somites it will have up to a point. Notice that uh, somatic mesoderm comes out here, splanchnic mesoderm comes out here. Now, where splanchnic mesoderm comes to lie down on the top of the underlying endoderm, 
it's going to form a two-part membrane called splanchnoplure. Whoa, what a word, one of the weirdest words in all of embryology. S-P-L-A-N-C-H, splanch, N-O, no, plure, P-L-E-U-R-E. It is a two-part membrane, splanchnoplure, made of lateral plate mesoderm, splanchnic mesoderm, and it's fused to the underlying endoderm underneath, and together they're going to form parts of the yolk sac, and also a garbage dump sac that comes off the back of the gut, called an allantois. Now, any living tissue will, as it metabolizes whatever carbon compounds it's working with, will produce toxic waste, waste products. Yeah, and in us, we just defecate that away or urinate it away and get rid of it. But if you are an embryo of a chicken trapped inside a prison called a shell and you can't get rid of this toxic, noxious material, urea, that is developing up inside there, you got to have a place, a garbage dump, where you can put it. And so this sac that forms is made of splanchnoplure, and it's called an allantois. We'll talk all about that in just a little while. All right. So, notice also there are some cells that have an origin here. Just as the nerve fold comes up, neural fold comes up on this side and that side, before they meet and fuse, right up here, to form a tube, there are some cells that are found right in the crease, right in that crevice there. They are called neural crest cells. This is the neural crest, and underneath here will be neural crest cells. Boy, are they important. We're going to talk about their special fate and what all they give rise to as we go along. So, as, our, as Henson's node regresses back down through the primitive streak over the hours 17 through 33 or so in the embryo's life, as it regresses, it changes all of this tissue in the mesoderm and some of the ectoderm up here on the top and begins forming stuff, embryonic parts, if you will. But up to this point, the embryo has just been a, a pancake, a flat sheet like that. Now, we know that our bodies are basically cylindrical. And so there has to be a process by which we take a flat sheet and we turn it into a cylinder, a hollow cavity that's elongated. Oh, the best analogy I think I've seen would be to take a sheet of plastic, of thick plastic, take a watermelon, <laughs> it looks like that, sit it on a table, put the plastic on top of it, and then begin to tuck the plastic around the watermelon from side to side and from front to back, tuck it in like that. And pretty soon what you will have formed from that sheet of plastic is a three-dimensional tube-like organism. You will have established a cylindrical body form by doing that. Here's what happens. The flat embryo begins to tuck in from the sides and from the front and the back. And ultimately, the front and back tuck in this way. Ultimately, a head will be formed up here and a tail will be formed back there. And the embryo will pinch itself free from the underlying, whatever's underneath here, endoderm and stuff. And eventually, what you'll have is a cylindrical, elongated body type that is formed. We're going from a two-dimensional beastie to a three-dimensional beastie in this folding mechanism that occurs. All right, let me show you that in a little more detail. Here we go. Here is the front end of an embryo. Here's the very front part of the nerve tube and the notochord underneath it, ectoderm on top and endoderm underneath, and all of this came from mesoderm for the most part. And then, in the front, 
just like we tucked that plastic underneath the front of the watermelon, a fold will begin to develop. And the fold will increase and will indent further and further and further. And eventually, what you'll have formed is the head of an embryo. The brain will form on the front end of the nerve tube, and the notochord will lie just underneath it. Now, the notochord, we talked about Henson's node being an inducer or an organizer in that it is responsible for causing one tissue to make another tissue do something. That's an induction event. Oh, by the way, there is a similar something that goes the other direction in embryonic development. It's called AP, AP, OP, OP, TOSIS, T-O-S-I-S, A-P-O-P-T-O-S-I-S, better known, programmed cell death. Yeah, whoa. And we see induction as a mechanism and apoptosis, these two mechanisms, at work in hundreds of places all over the inside of the embryo, causing it to form its unique shape and have its unique uh, chemical and physical characteristics. So the head fold will form by the tucking in of this membrane right here until what we have is a head formed right there. And notice that the endoderm, that's this layer underneath here, gets pushed up into the head to form the foregut, the front gut, the anterior most part of the digestive tract. This opening off of the midgut down here in the middle, up into the foregut, that opening right there is an opening into a tube, and it is called the anterior intestinal portal. This is part of an intestine or gut. And this is on the front end, anterior, and it is the opening or portal leading into it. So anterior intestinal portal will be the opening into the foregut as the head forms. There will be an, a tail formation on the other end using a similar mechanism. The back end of the embryo would be here, and it would begin to tuck in like that and eventually tuck around like that. And part of the hindgut will come up into the tail right there. And then there will be a plate that forms where this endoderm and the outer ectoderm come together and fuse and eventually break through. That will be the anal vent, the anal opening right there. Up in the front, where the endoderm fuses with the under overlying ectoderm to form a plate, this pharyngeal plate, pharyngeal membrane, or oral plate, that will break through to form the mouth opening, mouth opening, the stomadial opening, as it's called. And right in here, where these cells push in, in the tucking, mesoderm is going to start forming the circulatory system. The heart will come to lie right there. Above it will be the nerve tube, and underneath that will be the notochord. Again, the notochord is an inducer telling the nerve tube right above it, oh, you over there become part of the brain, and you back here, you go spinal cord down through the back. Okay? So we got head fold formation and tail fold formation coming by a tucking action that takes place from side to side. And eventually what we wind up with is something that looks like this. Head and tail folds. There we go. With a yoke all underneath here. There's a mid-gut that's not really a gut at all. It's just where the gut will form in the middle. And then there's a hindgut back here and a foregut up there. Here's the heart. You can see the what has, what has been going on all along. Up on top inside here will be the brain on the front end of the nerve tube, and the spinal cord will come from the rest of the nerve tube. Underneath it will be that cartilaginous rod, the notochord. Right in here will be the heart. Isn't that cute? Anyway, <laughs> this opening right here, we, we said, is the anterior intestinal portal up into the foregut. This is called a posterior intestinal portal, but we won't see that quite as much as we look at the embryos. Now notice out here, there is somatopleur on top, 
and splanchnopleur on the bottom. Same thing over here. Somatopleur on top, splanchnopleur on the bottom. What is somatopleur? It's somatic lateral plate mesoderm underneath and ectoderm plastered against it. It's actually one membrane, but it's made of two kinds of tissue glued together. This will fold up and on this side around behind the embryo and back up. This will fold around the front of the embryo and back up like that. And these two folds are going to meet somewhere in the middle, right in here. And when they do, they're going to form a sac around the embryo. Now, there are four extra embryonic sacs or membranes that we have to learn about. One is a yolk sac. It contains yolk. Here's the edge of it. It comes from splanchnopleur. That's endoderm and splanchnic mesoderm. Both of those two. And that, will, that sac will grow around the yolk supply in the chicken. OK. This splanchnopleur will grow around the other side. The somatopleur will grow up like this and eventually will form a sac that will contain the embryo in a fluid environment. In humans, it's called an amnion, and it is full of amniotic fluid, which breaks just before, that sac breaks open just before birth. A woman's water breaks, and all that fluid comes out, and that's a signal that it's imminent. Within 24 hours, she will give birth. If she doesn't give birth, her uh, obstetrician will induce her to give birth by giving her a drug which causes her to go ahead, oxytocin, and go ahead and to give birth. So this is how the three-dimensional elongated cylindrical body comes to be in a chicken embryo. There are going to be two sacs that come from splanchnopleur. One is the sac around the yolk, called a yolk sac, and another one we haven't seen yet, but it will come propin I'll come out of the hindgut, and it will be that garbage dump I told you about, where uric acid crystals are stored away from the living tissue up inside the little prison, the eggshell that the embryo is in. And eventually, what will happen is the little chick will crack the egg and walk away, and it will leave the Allen toys behind in the old eggshell. It'll throw away its garbage dump with its old eggshell. All right, let's continue. We have talked about body sculpting, folding from front to back, front to back. But what about from side to side? Well, we've got to look at that, too. So there is a tucking in action from side to side that occurs. Here is the early embryo. It's still that flat pancake shape laying up on top of the yolk. It's really primitive, very early. Notice that the somites from the lateral plate mesoderm are forming here. Oh, there's some intermediate little lump right there that begins to form. Going to give rise to kidneys and gonads, actually. But out beside that, in the lateral plate mesoderm, it will divide in a body cavity, or salome will form right in here between these two layers. The upper layer called somatic mesoderm, remember? and the bottom layer called splanchnic mesoderm. The somatic mesoderm, right here, and the ectoderm are going to come together and form somatopleur. The bottom layer of lateral plate mesoderm will plate down against the top of the underlying endoderm, and together they will form splanchnopleur. We've already talked about that and how that happens. Notice that with body folding, remember, we took our watermelon and we not only tucked in the plastic from the front and back, we tucked it in around the sides, too. Well, this embryo has a tucking action from the side over here and from the side over there that folds this lateral plate material around. And eventually, it comes together and meets and pinches right there. And when it does, it forms the cylindrical bod from side to side, with the body cavity up inside here, a yolk sac or gut right in the middle. Then that is suspended 
that gut is suspended inside the digestive tract, the peritoneal cavity, in the gut, right in here, by a couple of mesenteries, membranes, one on the ventral side, the bottom side of the gut, called the ventral mesentery, and one on the top side, it's dorsal, or up above, called the dorsal mesentery, dorsal mesentery, ventral mesentery, that kind of tend to hold the gut in shape. Now, it wiggles, it gives, so if I do that, uh, uh, the gut inside my stomach isn't yanked in place, isn't tacked down in place, but can slide around a little bit. Not a lot, but a little bit. Um, unless you are a woman who has endometriosis, in which case it can't slide anymore, and anytime you move, ooh, it hurts. We'll talk about that later. All right, notice that the yolk gets uh, sequestered out here in a yolk sac. The umbilical cord will be the only place up and down the ventral side of the embryo where this tucking in and pinching off will not occur. Where the umbilical cord comes out right there, it won't pinch in two, but instead it will have a, a cord that comes out with umbilical blood vessels in it, leading to mother's uh, placenta and her blood supply. All right, so let's put all this together now in a drawing and talk about the four extra embryonic membranes that are going to be formed from somatopleura and splanchnopleura. This is figure double A. Here's our embryo. Starts right here, goes around there, comes around here. Here's the head, it comes around there. There's the heart growing. And we see that the pinching action will come together right there, ultimately leading to a sac lined with uh, splanchnopleur, called a yolk sac, and then coming off the back gut, we haven't seen this before, there will be a, t a, a sac that grows off back here. Here's the hind gut, right in there, and there's a sac, at, at first it's just a little bitty evagination, but it grows and gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and eventually it becomes huge. It is the garbage dump, it is the place where nitrogenous poisonous waste are stored out of the way to get them away from the living tissue right up in here. And it's called the allantois. So the yolk sac and the allantois are made of those two layers, the underlying endo endoderm and the overlying splanchnic mesoderm to form that bipartite two-part membrane called splanchnopleur. The somatopleur comes out here folds around, and then folds back around here. And when it does, this part that comes out here and comes out there forms something called a chorion. A chorion is a membrane that comes to lie just underneath the shell membrane, and it contains everything that's going on inside the chicken egg, the chorion. But that somatopleur, as it folds around, will come to here, fold back that way, Somatopleur folds around here, come to here, and eventually it's going to meet and fuse. And when it does, that's called the seroamniotic connection, right there. Seroamniotic connection. It'll pinch in two, and what we'll wind up with is a sac made out of somatopleur that goes around the embryo, all the way back around to that side and it will fill with fluid, and that's the amnion. The other one, part of this membrane that's left over, will enclose everything inside the egg right there and form another extra embryonic membrane called a chorion. So the amnion and the chorion come from somatopleur. But the allantois and the yolk sac come from splanchnopleur. Got us Think about that until you can understand that. There will also be on the outside here a shell membrane and then in a bird, a calciferous shell, or in a rectal, a leathery-like shell on the outside there. At the time of hatching, the only connection that this embryo will have with all this other stuff will be an umbilical cord and it'll just break in two. So, 
That's the extra embryonic membrane development. That's chicken embryo development with some new big words that we have learned. Um, I suppose that's about as far as we want to take this at this point in chick development. That has been chick one and chick two. And um, you've learned an awful lot. So I thank you very much. Here's another bird to end with. Thank you. Good day.